Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to our online worship service. Wherever you're located or whatever time of day it is as you view this service, we thank you for joining us and we pray that God will bless you and that you'll feel the comfort of his presence as we worship him together. My name is Ken Carter. I'm a member of Brighton Road Baptist and I'll be leading our service today. Our pastor, Tim, will be bringing God's word to us, focusing on the parable of the persistent widow in chapter 18 of Luke's Gospel. And Michael Hogg, our leader of community evangelism, will be leading us in the celebration of communion later in the service. So you may want to have some bread and wine or an alternative drink ready to join us around the Lord's table. Our call to worship this morning is taken from the first five verses of Psalm 99, which read, The Lord is King, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion, he is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name, holy is he. Mighty King, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Extol the Lord our God, worship at his footstool. Holy is he. And so we respond in worship as we sing our opening song. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our songs shall rise to thee. And so we worship God together. Let's pray together. Holy God, creator of life, you call us out of our dark places, 
offering us grace and peace and new life in you. In times when we see nothing but hopelessness, you draw near and comfort us with the breath of your spirit. Lord, will you call us out of our complacency and routines and set us free from our self-imposed bonds, filling us with your spirit of love and compassion and peace for our world and for those who live around us. Holy God, we come this morning seeking your truth, your kindness, your justice. We thank you that you are with us this day, wherever it is that we're worshipping you. So may we feel your presence and welcome you into the depths of our lives. We thank you and praise you and adore you, Holy God, for choosing to share your life with us in and through your Son, Jesus. May this time of worship and the service of our lives reveal our thanksgiving and wonder that you should so care for us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Over these last few weeks, we've been experiencing a renewed sense of freedom as some of the lockdown restrictions are eased, which means that we can now physically visit local shops and eat outdoors and restaurants and get haircuts and enjoy meeting friends again in small groups, albeit perhaps in rather cold gardens as we move gradually back towards the lifestyle that we once knew, unhindered by government edicts and restrictions, however necessary they may have been. And of course, our thoughts as a church naturally turn to how we will return to live worship once again and how our various groups and activities will recommence and when and in what form. And whilst our church, like many, have been able to introduce some limited forms of worship in small groups, there's no question that our future life and work will look very different from what it was in the past. And our church family will be aware of the refreshed vision for our future that we feel God is calling us towards. And this has been shared by our pastor Tim in recent services and in our weekly bulletins over the last few weeks. That's why we're seeking to dedicate the six weeks between Easter and Pentecost in concerted prayer to discern God's will for our future life and to listen for his leading and guidance for the decisions that we must make and the direction that we should follow as we emerge from this time of enforced closure and separation. The passage that Tim will be fo focusing on in our service today tells the story of a struggling widow who had been badly wronged by another person and who sought justice from the local judge a ruthless and uncaring man whose sole objective seemed to be to look out for his own interests. The story describes how through sheer determination and unwavering persistence, the widow finally wears down the judge and convinces him to rule in her favour and to enact the justice that she rightly deserved. And for us as a church family, perhaps we collectively need to follow that widow's example of persistence as we pray for our church and its future life and work. But through the widow's persistence in her pursuit of justice, we also see another important attribute, that of patience. Patience to wait for the decision to be made and the answer given at the right time. And so we too should be patient in our persistence and allow God to speak to us and to lead us forward and make known his will for our church in his timing and according to his will. And I hope our service this morning will encourage all of us to be persistent in our prayers for our church over these next few weeks. And so we sing again our next song. You are the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord.
We come together to pray. Father God, we pray firstly for the leaders of our church. Lord, please be with them. Grant them mercy. Grant them vision. Grant them strength, Lord, and protection in the week ahead. We pray for the leaders of the church in the UK, across the whole country. Father, we pray that you would please be with these leaders, that you would guide them, that you would give them the vision that they need to take this nation to become a nation for Jesus. Lord, we pray for all those that need healing, and Father, those that are ill, we pray that you would please lay your healing hand upon them, that your mercy will be with them in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for all those that are mourning. We pray, especially at this time, still for the Queen, Lord, and her family. We pray also for all those that have lost loved ones in the recent months and weeks. Father, we pray for all the missionaries that are in the mission fields from our church and from other churches throughout the world, Lord. Father, we pray for clarity for a way ahead as we open to restart our church. Show us how you want us to continue. Give us all the wisdom, strength, and the ability to hear your voice and the desires of your heart as we seek to connect with the world around us again. Help us to be your hands, your feet, your heart, your ears. Help us to make your love known in the world around us. Lord, we just ask you to please be with every single person that is listening to this, every single person that is in our church. Father, just be with them, strengthen them in this week ahead. Father, give us a sense of community. Give us a sense again of excitement and a passion for you, Lord. Fill our hearts, Lord, with the desires of your hearts. Fill our minds with that which you wish us to dwell on, Lord. Help us to be strong, Lord, in everything that we do for you. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today's reading is from Luke chapter 18, verse 1 to 8, the New International Version. It's the parable of the persistent widow. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones, who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice, and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? I'd like to thank Carrie and Neville for bringing our prayers of intercession and our scripture reading this morning. In a few moments, our pastor Tim will be bringing us God's word. But first, we're going to sing again, a song that takes the form of a prayer and picks up on the theme of justice, which Tim will be exploring with us in Luke's gospel. God of the poor, friend of the weak, Give us compassion, we pray. Melt our cold hearts, let tears fall like rain. Come, change our love from a spark to a flame. Beauty for brokenness. And so we sing together again.
In his memorable parable of the widow and the judge, Jesus portrays two people at opposite ends of the social spectrum. On the one hand, we have the widow. She is the epitome of social fragility and powerlessness. She has no one to stand up for her, no one to protect her. She is alone and vulnerable and helpless. If she has no resources of her own to draw on, then in the absence of any kind of social security system, she is completely and utterly lost. And it looks as though someone has taken advantage of her because she is appealing to the local judge for justice. Maybe someone has robbed her or defrauded her of her savings or is looking to evict her from her home or maybe she's being fleeced by unscrupulous creditors. We don't know, but we can presume that her situation is desperate. The only recourse open to her is to go to the local judge and plead her case. But this judge has no interest in defending the rights of the orphan and the widow. Justice is not his main concern. He is a man who openly professes not to fear God or to regard other people. Instead, he enjoys the privilege, the power, the prestige that come with his elevated status. Now, the legal system in those days was beset by corruption. And it's highly likely that this particular judge was not averse to finding in favour of those plaintiffs who could make it worth his while financially. But this widow had nothing to offer him. And so the chances of her securing any kind of settlement from this judge were remote, to say the least. For someone in her position having to deal with a judge like this, well, that was nothing short of a disaster. He was the last person on earth to give her justice. But either because she was desperate or perhaps because she was strong-willed, this widow did not give up. Day after day, she came before the judge, pestering him, grinding him down, wearing him out, to the point where she was ruining his life. Every morning, he dreaded the prospect of seeing her again. And at night, his frustration with her kept him awake. And gradually, he began to wonder whether it might not be easier just to give in so that she'd stop bothering him and he could get his life back again. The whole thing had become a battle of wills and against all odds, the widow was winning this war of attrition. The judge felt as if day by day she was giving him a battering. When he talks about feeling as if she's going to wear him out with her continual coming to him, the word used is actually quite a violent one. It was a term used in boxing for hitting someone in the face and giving them a black eye. So eventually, the judge gives her what she wants. Not because he is remotely bothered about the justice of her cause. He just needs to get rid of her. Now, says Jesus, take that as a picture of how prayer works. Jesus is not saying that God is like a corrupt judge who has no concern for justice. But the disparity between the widow and the judge is comparable to the disparity between us when we pray and the God who is the judge of all the earth. God has all the power and we have none. Some people struggle with the idea of prayer. They ask, why should God be bothered with my requests? They have this view that God is far too high and exalted and inscrutable and inaccessible for their prayers to carry any weight with him. What chance do we have? about as much chance as a widow with a corrupt judge. But Jesus says, look at the widow in the parable. She never gave up. She carried on and on and on, day after day after day, until eventually the judge gave in. And Jesus uses a teaching technique of arguing from the lesser to the greater. If a powerful, corrupt judge eventually gives in to the persistent pleas of a helpless widow, how much more is God going to take account of the cries of his people who petition him day and night for justice? Unlike the judge in the parable, justice is at the centre of God's heart. And unlike the judge in the parable, God is concerned for his people in our weakness and our vulnerability. So pray, pray, keep on praying. Don't give up. Jesus invites us to, to eyeball God, to challenge God to a staring match. Who's going to blink first? Make sure it isn't you. 
If the widow can secure justice from a corrupt and unjust judge by her persistence, then how much more should we persist in prayer until God takes up our cause? If something really matters to you, don't stop praying about it. As a colleague of mine once said, prayerlessness is practical atheism. So think of that widow and give God no rest until you secure some kind of answer to your prayers. Not that Jesus is writing us a blank cheque, inviting us to badger God for whatever we want. The widow in the parable was hungry for justice. And when Jesus draws out the meaning of the parable, he talks about God bringing justice to his chosen ones who keep honoured him day and night. When we pray about justice, well, on a global scale, there's enough to keep us praying 24-7. And let's not forget as we pray that we have an immensely privileged position in the West. And so we need to ask, in terms of climate change, in terms of world poverty, in terms of fair trade, how is God calling you to turn your prayer into action, to change your lifestyle, to play your part in making a positive difference? And let's not forget that if we turn a blind eye to the injustices of the world, if we shrug our shoulders and say, well, it's not my problem, then we are aligning ourselves with the corrupt judge in the parable who neither feared God nor respected anyone else. When we pray, we are praying to the God of all the earth who wants to put his passion for justice at the centre of our hearts. So praying for justice is far bigger than praying for our own personal wants or needs. But that's not to say that our wants or needs don't count. The widow is bringing her own personal appeal to the judge and we are encouraged to bring our own personal pleas to God as well, either for ourselves or for those who are close to our hearts. But let's recognise that what we want is not the same as what we need, and it's not the same as what is right either. But when, like Abraham, we appeal to the judge of all the earth to do what is right, then we can be sure that he hears us. And we mustn't give up. As one commentator put it, ceaseless praying is indispensable. You may have heard of the acronym PUSH which stands for Pray Until Something Happens. And for a while, wristbands with push on them were quite popular. I like the phrase, pray until something happens. It sums up the call to persistence, which lies at the heart of this parable. But it also leaves plenty of room for the sovereignty of God, because sometimes the something that happens is not quite the answer you are hoping for or expecting or asking for. Yes, sometimes God does answer our prayers directly in the way that we've asked, in the way that we expect or hope. We cast ourselves on his mercy, we appeal to his sovereignty, and God answers our prayers directly. Perhaps because our prayers are in line with his overarching will and purpose, or perhaps because God is gracious and compassionate, takes account of our pleas, and steps in to intervene on our behalf, something which he is free and able and prepared to do. Sometimes we don't see God's intervention, but we we just get a sense that we can leave the situation, the person we're praying for, in God's hands now. We can entrust them to his sovereign love and care. God, in effect, says, OK, leave this with me. And in such cases, it can be a step of faith to say, OK, God, I'm going to trust you on this one. And it may be right then to stop badgering him in prayer. That's, That's not the same as giving up. That's about believing that God has told you he's going to deal with it and trusting him for an answer. At other times, we may find that God steps in to resolve the situation in unexpected ways. We ask for X, but get Y instead. The classic example of this is the prayer said to have been found in the pocket of a Confederate soldier killed in the American Civil War. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly how to obey. I asked for health, that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity, that I might do better things. I asked for riches, that I might be happy. I was given poverty, that I might be wise. I asked for power, that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness, that I might feel the need of God. 
I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything I'd hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed. The God we belong to keeps faith with his people. He hears and answers prayer. Will you keep faith with him by praying, not giving up until something happens? And remember that Jesus closed his parable with a searching question, one I leave with you to ponder. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? First Peter chapter 2 and verses 21 to 24 include these words. For this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you should follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sin, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And so as we prepare to celebrate communion together, we sing the song, Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us, and we, Remember.
we share together now in communion, in breaking bread together, in sharing the cup together. Wherever we are, participating online, we join together in the presence of God and by the Spirit of God and in the name of Jesus Christ, Son of God. Grace and peace to you in the name of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. You may be joining by yourself or you may be with others in your household. The Lord Jesus invites us to participate. We come as we are. We remember together all that God has done for us through Christ's death and resurrection. We remember his promise to return. We are conscious of our need for forgiveness and the indwelling of his life. So let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for his death upon the cross and your raising him to life again. We thank you that because of this we have forgiveness and hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Saviour Jesus, you are present with us by your Spirit, whom you freely give to live within the lives of those who hear and respond to your voice, your call to follow me. We give you thanks and praise. Christ, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Spirit of God, thank you for drawing us to the cross and revealing and convicting us of our sin and need for forgiveness. Thank you for pointing us to new life through Christ Jesus alone. We give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. In Luke chapter 24, we read these words about Jesus and his companions as they broke bread together after meeting on the road to Emmaus. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him. Their testimony was this, it is true, the Lord has risen. Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. Jesus himself stands with us today, wherever we are, geographically, and spiritually and in compassion he says to each one of us peace be with you again let us pray O sovereign god indeed meet with us in the breaking of bread and the sharing of the cup open our minds so that we may understand the scriptures that point to you Open our hearts that we may receive you as we reject all indifference, all rebellion, all fear. We thank you for your cleansing, your indwelling, your commissioning. We remember how Jesus said to his disciples, This is what is written, The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So, Father, we give ourselves afresh to you in repentance and in humble service, starting from wherever we are now, today, asking that we might be clothed from on high for all that you have prepared for us to do 
and to be in the coming times and places. Lord our God, who provides all that we need, we bring you these simple gifts of bread and wine. May you nourish us with these provisions for the journey by faith in you. Grant that our hearts may be aflame with Jesus' words to us, a fire that spreads to those around us as we speak them and live them out in obedience. Amen. So we take the bread and we break it. Remembering and proclaiming Jesus' body was given for us. And we eat together, giving thanks. I thank you, Father, for your provision of a Saviour. We read how after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you drink, uh, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we drink together, giving thanks. And we pray. Lord of life, we thank you for Jesus and him crucified and raised to new life. Thank you for his appearing to his disciples out on the road and when they were in confusion and despair and also appearing behind closed and locked doors when they were fearful and doubting. We continue to place our trust in you, Lord our God, in these days ahead. Be with us in the uncertainties, in the challenges and changes we face. Be with us in the highs and the lows, in the glad times and the sad times, when we feel confident and when we are struggling. Have mercy upon each one of us and upon us together as church. For we cannot go forwards in hope without you. Bless us and make us to be a blessing to all around us. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for joining us for our online service today. Whilst we've been kept physically apart, we hope that you've truly felt part of God's family as we've spent time in worship together. And so we conclude our service with these words of commission. Go now, awakened to the voice of God, who speaks in his word and his world. As you leave this time of worship, be listening amid the noise of everyday life. Be persistent, for the one whom you follow is not dead, nor are his teachings and his promises. Do not get discouraged. Keep asking, seeking, knocking, for times of receiving and finding and opening will come. Christ Jesus is alive. Be alive in him, his word written upon your heart, always there. Amen.